So before we begin this video, I want to give a quick disclaimer. You may notice some visual hiccups in the footage at certain points, and while I can't say I know the exact cause of it, I know it has something to do with the capture card. It was having a few different technical issues while I was recording my footage for this video. There wasn't really anything I could do to fix this, so I apologize in advance. Now with that said, on to the video. So, we have a new Crash game. What the crap? And yes, I know I started my last review with that, but I still can't fully believe this actually happened. For such a long time, the idea of a brand new Crash game seemed like an absolute pipe dream. But once the Insane Trilogy and Nitro Field came out and proved to be huge successes, it went from an impossibility to a probability. And sure enough, only one year after Nitro Field, we now find ourselves with Crash Bandicoot 4, the first brand new Crash game, not counting mobile games, in 12 years. The subtitle says it all, it's about freaking time. Well, I added the freaking part, but details. Given this momentous occasion, it was pretty evident that I was going to want to review this. However, I decided to wait on it a bit for two reasons. One, I hadn't reviewed the original trilogy yet and felt to be appropriate to cover those first. And two, I wanted to give as accurate of an opinion as I could. If I reviewed this right out the gate, I would have very likely still been in the honeymoon phase. So instead, I gave myself some time after my initial playthrough, and then went ahead and did a second, less hype-driven playthrough for the sake of this video. How did this second playthrough affect my opinion on the game, you ask? Well, you'll be finding out shortly. Though before we begin, I do want to give a quick heads up. This review is not spoiler free. I'll be talking about late game content and story beats in this, so you have been warned. With that said, let's dive into this adventure 12 years in the making. Well, actually more like 2-3 to three years, but again, details. So in classic Crash tradition, Crash 4 picks up the story from where Crash Bandicoot Warped left off. In Warped's 100% ending, Entropy's Time Twister machine imploded and trapped Uka Uka, Cortex, and Entropy in a dimensional prison, albeit as babies. Crash 4 starts off with the three of them, now having grown back up, attempting to find a way out. Well, Uka Uka and Entropy are trying at least. Cortex is kind of busy losing his mind. Finally, Uka Uka yells so loud that he manages to rip open a dimensional rift before falling unconscious, allowing for Cortex and Entropy to finally escape. They discover the existence of a multiverse, and now plot to conquer all dimensions with the use of a rift generator, while having Engine and Embryo gather up and amplify an army to help their cause. Not entirely sure how they managed to get Brio back on their side after what happened in Crash 2, but his dialogue does imply a desire to backstab Cortex, so that could play a part. However, the scientists' dimensional antics have unintentionally summoned the Quantum Masks, a group of masks with control over space and time, something that Aku Aku senses and has Crash act upon it. Upon finding the first Quantum Mask, Lonnie Loli, Crash and Coco set off to find the other Quantum Masks and stop Cortex and Entropy. Now if this was a game in the original trilogy, that's where the story emphasis would come to a stop. But instead, Crash 4 actually follows more so in the footsteps of something like Twin Sanity or the Titans games when it comes to story, as there's much more of a focus on it. Other characters get tangled into the conflict, such as a retired Dingo Dial and an alternate reality version of Crash's ex-girlfriend Tana. And even Cortex ends up joining the heroes after Entropy reveals he's begun plotting with a new partner he met from another dimension. I will say, I do like this emphasis on story they go with here. It's not something we've seen terribly often in Crash games, and it gives the characters a chance to stand out more than usual. I was already a fan of Dingo Dial before, but the game gives them more to work with as a character, especially now that he's retired and opened a diner. Hey, I see what you did there. Cortex really benefits from this as well, allowing him to have a pretty interesting character arc, but I'll get more into that later. Heck, even Crash and Coco are able to shine more as characters, and Crash doesn't even say a word, which on a side note, Crash is utterly precious in this game. That said, there is one part of the story that I feel like could have used a bit more time in the oven, and that has to do with Entropy. Or more specifically, the other Entropy. It's revealed partway through that this new partner Troopy met is a female version of himself from the same dimension as the alternate Tana. And while I like her design and what we do see of her character, I wish we had gotten more. Prior to the fight against the two Troopies, all we get to see of her is her debut scene, where she and male Troopy show just how narcissistic they can be by flirting with each other, and her pre-boss scene where she reveals that she killed the crashing Coco of Tana's dimension. In comparison, all the other villains get quite a bit more time to shine. Cortex has plenty of scenes, both before and after his switch, and Engine and Embryo talk to you throughout the levels of the worlds that you fight them in. And even in Male Troopy's case, even though he gets only a few scenes, he's been in previous games, we know what he's like. This is Femme Troopy's first ever appearance in the series, and all she gets are two scenes and a boss fight. At the very least, I feel like we could have gotten the scene where the Troopies actually meet, because her reveal in the story just feels far too abrupt. But yeah, aside from the Femme Troopy stuff, I think the story overall is handled quite well, and the character writing especially is quite spot on. I got a fair amount of laughs for the dialogue throughout the game. How many times have you beaten this clown anyway? Three. Really? Only three? <laughs> Funny. Seemed like more. Do you have any idea how stubborn I used to be? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Guests of Crash Bandicoot stay at Ensane Beach Suites, which is just a log with some moss on it. The moss is really soft, though, so you should be able to get a good night's sleep. What, are you too good to sleep on a log? Sorry, Your Majesty, I suppose you want a continental breakfast instead of a handful of ants that make their nest under the tree. Jeez Louise, there's no pleasing some people! Now, there is more story stuff I really like here, but again, I'll get to that later. So even in a more story-heavy Crash game, gameplay is still the primary focus. So how's about we talk about that now? As to be expected, Crash 4 very much falls in the footsteps of the original trilogy, though it does take more from Crash 1 and 2 rather than Warped, as the game puts a primary focus on the platforming levels. Vehicle sections are very few and far between this time around, and most of the ones it does have are taken straight from Crash 2. Actually, it's pretty evident throughout that Crash 2 was the game the devs looked at the most as a basis when making this game. Both for better and for worse. But let's not jump the gun just yet. Even Crash's moveset is pretty much the exact same as it was in Crash 2, with the only new ability from Warped carrying over being the double jump. There's been some tweaks to how certain moves function, with the slide giving you a larger window of opportunity to do a slide jump when sliding off a ledge, thank goodness, and the slide into spin attack being a much more reliable way to pick up speed. I never even brought this ability up in my last review because it doesn't serve much additional purpose in Crash 2 or 3, but in 4, it's incredibly useful. Beyond those though, there aren't really any new abilities for Crash himself, aside from being able to grind on rails in these fun little sections, and a special spin attack ability you unlock by beating the game. And also wall running. But honestly, I'm cool with that. It took a bit of time to get used to, but this might be the best crash is controlled in the series thus far. My single issue with the movement tweaks is that you can body slam out of a slide jump now. And given the slide and body slam are dumb on the same button, there were too many times that I unintentionally body slam out of a slide jump. Usually to my death. Also, I do need to correct myself. I refer to all these as tweaks to Crash's moveset, but it's more so to Crash and Coco's moveset. Yep, carrying over an addition from Ansane Trilogy, Coco's playable in Crash 4. And unlike in Ansane, where she couldn't be used in Crash's vehicle levels or boss fights, she's playable for use in any level that Crash can go to, meaning that after the first world, you could play just as Coco for the entirety of the game. Granted, it's just an aesthetic change, but I like that it's here regardless. Though while that's all that Crash and Coco have for their own movesets, that's not the only tricks they have up their sleeves. As I said earlier, there are a few vehicle sections brought back from the past games, such as animal riding. Now admittedly, I do think these aren't executed as well as in Crash 2 or 3. For one, while Polar and this new alien thing are both cute, there's no animal riding section with Pura, so this game is an immediate 0 out of 10. Though on a more serious note, I found the controls in these sections to feel a bit more stiff than they had been in 2 or 3. Not quite as bad as in Crash 1, but it does make some jumps or even some crate gathering a bit bit harder than it really needed to be. That said, the other vehicle sections are executed quite well. For instance, the jet board from 2 makes a return, and it controls largely the same as before, because hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. There's also much more variety in the level design for these sections, which is a plus. The biggest surprise vehicle section-wise though, they brought back the Atlasphere from Wrath of Cortex! Granted, it's only used for a single chase sequence, but you know what? I am not complaining. They brought back the best part of Wrath of Cortex and mixed it in with a series staple, and it works incredibly well. Actually, having said that, Crash 4 does go the Wrath of Cortex route with chase sequences, offering a variety of set pieces with each of them, whether that's running from a giant voodoo spirit, or atlas fearing away from a monster truck, or outrunning a T-Rex in a volcanic canyon. I really like the variety of set pieces, and they're all incredibly fun, though I've definitely got biased for the monster truck one because of the atlas fear. I had no idea it was even in the game when I got to it. Going back to Crash and Coco's movesets though, there is one other thing they have at play. That being, of course, the Quantum Masks. These masks pop up every so often throughout levels, giving you access to the reality-altering abilities. There's the previous invention, Lani Loli, who can phase objects in and out of reality, Akano, who provides a dark matter-powered tornado spin that you can use to glide or tear apart metal crates, Kapunawa, who can slow down time, and Ika Ika, who can flip gravity. So admittedly, I'm not the biggest fan of Ika Ika, because while his gravity power is definitely used for some creative platforming puzzles, I just found his power kind of disorienting to use. Then again, beyond Mario Galaxy, I've never really cared for gravity shifting mechanics of this kind of platformers. Messes with my head a bit too much. Also, he has this whole double personality thing going on, except the second personality only has two lines of dialogue in a single cutscene, so it felt... kinda pointless, admittedly? Akano's alright, though controlling his tornado spin felt a bit slippery at points. Not to say about him as a character either, he's the stoic, minimal talking type. I quite liked Lonnie Loli. He's a fun character, and the game has some creative, albeit very challenging, reality shifting puzzles, especially closer to the end. Though easily my favorite of the bunch is Kapunawa and not just because her power is time. For one, I really like her character. 
being a kind of senile but still loving grandmother kind of character. And the ways her power are used in the game are really brilliant, especially with Nitro Crates. Because why slowly tiptoe across Nitro Crates like in Wrath of Cortex when you can slow down time so you can run across them before they blow up? I never got sick of the way they use these time slow Nitro puzzles. It's such a clever idea and the game uses it to its fullest. I love it. Overall though, the Quantum Masks were a great addition, and the game uses their abilities to the fullest when it comes to its challenge, especially in the final level. Holy crap, that might be one of my favorite gauntlets of challenges in any platformer. Tough as it was, it felt incredibly rewarding to pull off successfully. Speaking of which, I also like the directions Crash 4 goes with its level design, for the most part. While it keeps itself limited to hallway-like design like before, there's a lot more done with them to make them far more varied from one another. See, as much as I love Warp's levels, they do follow a relatively samey structure throughout, and I can see why someone wouldn't be as much of a fan of that. Crash 4, fortunately, doesn't fall into this same pit, with a larger variety of structures, of obstacles, some parts even open up a bit more, while not losing that hallway-like feel that Crash is known for. Not to say it always nails it in the execution, but it's definitely a step in the right direction for this series. The game also pretty much completely gets rid of the original trilogy's issue of levels feeling samey location-wise, as pretty much every level feels distinct from one another, even within the same world. For instance, the first Ice World level has you navigating a frozen tundra, but then the next one has you traversing a makeshift base of cortexes within an icy cavern. Or another example, the first Pirate World level has you going through caves and across shoreline docks, but the next level has you jumping from boat to boat as Tana. Actually, on that note, I think it's time to address the other types of levels beyond Crash and Coco's. As you progress through the game, you unlock levels where you play as either Tana, Dingo Dial, or Cortex. Some are mandatory, but most of them are optional alternate timeline levels, showing these characters' path in a specific part of the story and how that intertwines with Crash and Coco's. Whenever you see these exclamation symbols over Crash and Coco in a level, it means that one of the other three had a part to play in that happening, and you'll be able to experience their side of that in an alternate level. I really like this! As for the characters themselves, Cortex is alright to play as. He often gets more maze-like puzzle platforming sections, using a ray gun that allows him to turn enemies into platforms. He also has a dash and a slight flutter after it, allowing you to correct your landing if need be, which is great. But on the flip side, his ray gun is manually aimed, making it rather finicky to sometimes shoot when you need to shoot. He is admittedly my least favorite of the three, but at least his dialogue makes up for it. Ooh, I've never tried a volcano lair! Do good guys have volcano lairs? Hmm, much to learn. <laughs> On second thought, no volcano lair. I can feel my nostril hairs sizzling. On the other hand, Tana and Dingo Dao are both really fun to play as. Tana's levels are a lot more about maneuverability, what with her grappling hook and wall jump, while Dingo Dao trudges around with a vacuum gun, allowing him to suck up crates and pick up TNTs to launch his projectiles at enemies or obstacles, or he can use the vacuum gun to hover. Between the two, I do prefer playing as Dingo Dao a bit more than Tana, but both of them are still great. My one problem with the alternate timeline levels, though, is that they're only really half levels. Once Tana, Dingo Dao, and Cortex get to the set piece that crosses over with Crash and Coco, the rest of the level is whatever remains of that Crash and Coco level, just with the crates put in different spots now. I get the feeling this was likely a time or money constraint issue, but having you play through Crash and Coco's levels again, rather than dedicating the entire level to whoever you were playing as before, does make it kind of feel like padding. Heck, admittedly, I only end up playing through the entirety of one alternate timeline level when footage gathering. I just dropped out of the other ones once I finished the first halves, especially since some of these set pieces happen early on in Crash and Coco's levels. That feeling of padding is actually kind of a noticeable issue with Crash 4 as a whole, which unfortunately brings us to the matter of completion. I'm sure you've heard people talk about how hard this game is, which... Yeah, it's incredibly hard, easily the hardest of the mainline Crash games. Now granted, for the most part, this is more so due to the challenge factor of the level design, rather than cheap nonsense or awkward controls and physics like in Crash 1, so it's not nearly as infuriating. When doing a casual run, playing Crash 4 casually, this is one of the best in the series, no doubt about it. But the moment you start going for 100%, the game quickly loses some of that greatness. For one, there is way too much to get in every level. Every level has six different gems, as well as six additional gems from the level's inverted variant, but then there's also the time trial relics, and the insanely perfect relics, and the flashback tapes, and the colored gems, and just calm down game! Okay, so let's go over these one at a time. First, the regular gems. Again, there are six per level. Three from collecting a certain amount of Wumpa Fruit, one from breaking every crate in the level, one that's hidden in the level, and one from beating the level with a maximum of three deaths. 
The Wumpa Fruit Gems are totally fine, you'll more than likely get them consistently without much hassle. The Hidden Gems fine too, they're often not too cruelly hidden, aside from a handful like the one in Run It By You. Seriously, how is anyone supposed to figure that out? The Three Deaths or Less Gem is definitely tough, but once you go through a level enough times, this one becomes a lot easier. Now as for the Crate Gem, oh boy! You know how every Crash game usually has a level or two where you end up one or two crates short by the end? Yeah, pretty much every level in Crash 4 is like this. As early as the third level, the game's hiding crates in blink and you'll miss it locations, or in areas that you gotta painstakingly go out of your way for. Honestly, some of these crates are more hidden than the freaking hidden gem. It gets to a point that it doesn't even feel rewarding to find those hidden crates, but rather frustrating when you think you found them all only to get to the end of the level and realize you missed one. Or worse, a whole lot of them. And that's just for the regular variant of the level. Every level also has an inverted variant with six more gems. And while yes, the inverted levels tend to look really cool, it just feels tedious having to go through the process twice over. Especially since the hidden gems put into a new location in the inverted levels. Though while talking about gems, let's talk about the colored gems. But before I do, I want to take a quick moment to clarify some things from the last review. As many people have told me, the secrets in Crash 2 aren't as hidden as I made them out to be. For instance, some point out that the nitros on the staircase don't bounce at all like nitros tend to, or how the level with the blue gems max crate tally updates to being out of zero once you have the crate gem. Admittedly, I didn't know about that last one, and I did overlook the lack of bounce in the staircase nitros, so I'll take the L on both of those. Granted, I'm still not a huge fan of how most of the secrets are handled in Crash 2, but I suppose outright calling them bad game design was rather exaggerated. Especially because they are tame in comparison to the colored gems in Crash 4. Like I said earlier, Crash 4 takes a lot of inspiration from Crash 2, and that includes the nature of secrets. Already kind of apparent with the hidden crates, but the colored gems are something extra special. For one, the world map doesn't even tell you which levels have the colored gems. Give Crash 2 credit, at least I told you that! Now yes, there is a clue in each of the levels that do have a colored gem, but they're easy to miss and and aside from the blue gems case, far too vague. Only reason I got the red gem when I was first streaming this game was because someone in chat outright told me how to get it. I don't know if I would have figured this out on my own. But then there's the blue gem, which had a different problem entirely. The hint was clear and easy to see, but the method was brutal. Like with Crash 2, you get the blue gem by beating the level without breaking a single crate. Here's the thing though, in Crash 2, this was in the first level. In Crash 4, it's nearly halfway through, in a level with a ton of using crates to get across gaps, let alone with a quantum mask whose whole ability is tearing apart crates. Getting the blue gem alone took me well over an hour to do, and I felt ready to pull my hair out by the time I was done. And somehow, that's not even the hardest part of the game, because I haven't talked about the insanely perfect relics or the flashback tapes yet. So to get the insanely perfect relic, you need to collect the levels Wumpa Fruit Gems, Crate Gem, and Three Deaths or Less Gem all in one run, while the flashback tapes are collectibles you find in the level, usually on or close to the main route. What's that? These don't sound too hard? Well, here's the catch with both of these. You have to do it in one go. You die once, you can't get either of them, and with how incredibly hard this game gets, you can imagine how brutal getting these are. I know this game takes bits and pieces from each of the original trilogy, but I feel like the beat the level in one go challenge could have just stayed behind in Crash 1. Now because I quickly determined that I wasn't going to bother getting 100% for this review, I didn't worry about getting the insanely perfect relics. However, the flashback tapes unlock secret flashback levels that show the trials Crash and Coco went through when they were still Cortex's minions, and these levels are really fun puzzle levels. So I went out of my way to get all the flashback tapes. Now for most of the game, that actually wasn't much of a problem, but by the final Final world, the tapes were pretty much right at the end of the levels, so getting them was torture. The worst one by far was the level Nitro Processing, which took me well over an hour to get its flashback tape. Almost didn't think it was worth it by that point. And I didn't even mention the time trial challenges, which I honestly didn't even bother with. And based on all the tweets I've seen about how difficult Platinum Relics are in this game, I don't think I ever will. And on top of that, they added a dev time tier of Relic above Platinum, which doesn't count to getting 100%, but at the same time, no, I'm good. With all these in mind, you're gonna be visiting each level a minimum of three times to get everything. Once for the regular gems, flashback tape and insanely relic, once for the inverted gems, and once for the time trial relics. But with the inclusion of alternate timeline levels, some levels get double that. Meaning some levels you'll be playing through a minimum of six times to get everything. And that's assuming you get everything on your first go, which frankly isn't very likely. Point is, a lot of what you need to do to get 100% feels like needless padding. And while yes, Crash games have required you to go back to get everything before, it's never felt this tedious. 
not even in Crash 1. Alright, that's enough time on the soapbox for now. To clarify, I do still like this game. Quite a lot, actually. But I think the 100 percent process does drag it down a fair bit. It just feels too monotonous to get everything. That said, there's more positives I want to go over, so let's go ahead and talk about those. First off, when starting a new game, you're given the option to either play in retro mode or modern mode, with the two modes determining if you have lives or not. Given there's some people who enjoy having lives, and some who- <laughs> Oh, that's really funny out of context. I didn't even think about that. Given there's some people who enjoy having lives, and some who find it to be an outdated game mechanic, <coughs> me, having this option was a great call. Additionally, while collecting gems can be pretty frustrating, what you get for doing so is totally worth it. Crash and Coco have a plethora of costumes that you unlock by collecting a certain amount of gems in certain levels. And fortunately, these take both the regular and inverted gems into account. So say you needed six gems for a costume, but you missed one gem in the regular level. That's alright, you just need one gem from the inverted version and bam you have enough and these costumes look great and to anyone who might be wondering my personal favorite costumes were the scorpion looking ninja outfits crash's pirate captain garb coco's painter outfit the crash warped biker jackets i'm not by stall what are you talking about and of course the retro costumes because low poly recreations in modern platformers is a trope i absolutely love also this balloon animal crash is really cursed and kind of hilarious to watch in cutscenes Speaking of visual related stuff, this game is superb when it comes to the visuals. For one, these are easily the best designs these characters have ever had, especially in the case of Crash and Cortex. These designs are actually perfect for them, and I will not hear otherwise. The environments are also wonderfully crafted, easily some of the most vibrant and lively worlds that the series has had. It's easy to tell that the same team who lovingly recrafted the Spiral Trilogy were the ones behind this game, because just as much as heart and effort were put into these new locales as in the Reignited Trilogy. And in my opinion, nowhere is that more apparent than the level Offbeat, this New Orleans-esque music festival that's ironically full of life for a festival full of ghosts and skeletons. It's even got some great easter eggs with characters like Spyro, Pinstripe, Pura, and even a Skylander all getting referenced. Actually, the references in this game in general go above and beyond. The carts from CTR and Nitrocart being stored away in Oxide Ship, the evil twins from Twin Sanity have a cameo, an image of Crunch is visible on some of the flashback levels, just to name a few. Now as for the music, I admittedly didn't really notice it all that much while playing the game, it kinda just blends in with the other audio, but listening to it on its own, the soundtrack is really well done. Some personal favorites include the main theme, the chase sequence of Hit the Road, where the music incorporates some of that Wrath of Cortex sound, fitting for the sequence with the atmosphere, Offbeat, of course, Run It By You, and the boss themes, which all wonderfully incorporate some leitmotif of those bosses' previous themes, but without it feeling like the only meat of the songs. Rather, it supports the songs. Actually, on the topic of bosses, while it is a bit weird that the only bosses are the scientist characters rather than any of the boss mutants, aside from that random sea monster mini boss, I'd say they're overall pretty good, though some are definitely better than others. For example, the embryo fight's just kind of okay, while the engine fight is utterly fantastic, once again following the tradition of engine consistently having amazing boss fights. The Cortex fight's also really great, but on the flip side there's the fight against the troopies. Now to be fair, the lead up to the fight is solid, complete with an easter egg that completely caught me off guard. I won't spoil it here, but if you do end up playing this game, make sure you get all the fruit in this section. And the music that plays is incredible, but the fight itself just feels rather lacking. Yeah, you get to use all the masks, which is thematically fitting, but the troopies only go down in two hits after chasing you in a circle around the rift generator. It definitely feels like this fight was supposed to have more originally. And judging this line from Fem Troopy before the fight, Let's see what you mean. Mongols can do as a pack. I get the feeling the original plan somehow incorporated Tana, Dingle Down, and Cortex in the fight as well, especially with how the post-fight cutscene plays out. It's a pretty disappointing boss fight, and if the game ended on this note, it would have felt a bit sour. Fortunately, though, this isn't where the game ends. Which with that said, I'm gonna give an additional spoiler warning now, because we're diving headfirst into the finale, and it's kind of incredible. So consider this your final warning. We good? Alright, so... After the troopies are defeated, the Quantum Masks take the heroes to a food-centric futuristic city as a means of resting up before sending everyone back to their dimensions. But while there, Cortex hatches a new plot of his own. See, throughout the game, it's quite clear that Cortex is just pretty much done with everything. Done playing second fiddle to others, done with having to constantly fight and lose to Crash, he just wants to be free of these burdens. And while joining with Crash and Coco temporarily gives him that freedom he's been looking for, once the troopies are defeated and he's fully free of that burden, he ends up re-embracing his evil nature and comes up with a new way to free himself of his conflict cycle, time travel. Using Kapunawa's powers, he goes back in time to before the events of Crash 1 so he can stop his past self from making Crash. And the final world takes place 
in Cortex's original castle. I absolutely love this scenario. The levels you traverse are quite reminiscent of the locales on Cortex's island in the first game. You get to hear passing present Cortex banter as past Cortex believes present Cortex is an imposter. Heck, there's even a clever reference to how Crash was originally conceived by Naughty Dog to be a wombat. Uh, why did you? I have to choose a bandicoot. If I just stuck with the wombat, this all could have been different. And this all culminates in a superb final battle against Cortex, where he yoinks the quantum masks from you and uses their power against you. Seriously, I love when games take core mechanics and apply them to an enemy or obstacle. It's a great way to test the player in my opinion, and this boss fight's no exception. And that's before mentioning the fantastic boss theme that incorporates light motif of both the Crash 1 theme and Cortex's boss theme from Warped. This is absolutely the kind of finale I wanted, and more than makes up for the lackluster fight against the troopies. So yeah, that's Crash 4. If you couldn't tell from my moments of gushing and whatnot, I do really like this game. And I definitely say it's one of the best Crash games. That said, I do think what's required for 100%ing, alongside some other elements, do hold it back. And I think overall, I do still prefer Warped. I feel like it stuffs itself with a bit too much. And especially when you factor in the high difficulty, it becomes kind of overwhelming, and oftentimes that fun can get lost. Now that said, Crash 4 is definitely a step in the right direction overall. And I just think they should cut back a bit on some elements in the next Crash game whenever that may be. I imagine there's gonna be a new Spyro game first, so I'll be willing to wait. That said, now that we do have Crash 4, we can officially say that Crash is fully back, and it's about time too. This has been Black Mage Maverick, and until the next video, have a nice day, everybody.